In January 2019, Gillette released a commercial short film titled The Best Men Can Be. The commercial was an anti-male propaganda piece, an all-out attack on men and boys, demonizing them as toxic, bullying, sexually predatory, violent, and borg-like in their behavior. The reaction to the commercial was almost universally negative. The Best Men Can Be quickly became one of the most disliked videos on YouTube. Gillette lost around 15% of their total sales, an estimated $350 million in the first six months after the ad, and Procter & Gamble, the parent company that owns Gillette, gave them an $8 billion valuation write-down in the aftermath of the calamitous public reaction. Today, we call this the Bud Light effect, though at the time, Gillette's loss in market share was criticized under the umbrella term, get woke, go broke. The best a man can be has been deleted from Gillette's YouTube and other social media, and the wonderful comments on the YouTube video have been lost to history. But here are two of the most popular comments which I present in the hopes of saving them for posterity. Harry's razors are cheaper and available at Walmart for the same or a better quality shave. Keep politics out of our grooming habits. Not buying any more. A company making billions from male grooming products trying to shame men for being men. Even the director of the short film, Kim Gehrig, distanced herself from it following immense backlash and criticism, stating, The project had actually been conceived, written and edited by men, but because I'm a female director, it fitted neatly into a troll's narrative. Gehrig's response was a standard play, produced the Get Out of Jail victim card, but there is an element of insight to be gleaned from her statement. Gehrig said, The project had actually been conceived, written, and edited by men. I don't believe for a second that this was all done by men, given that women make up 60% of marketing employees, but it's clear that Gillette put a lot of thought and effort into this commercial. The best men can be wasn't just a standard buy our products billboard, especially since Gillette products don't appear in the ad. It was an ambitious, carefully thought out attempt at a public rebranding. This commercial was a major event for Gillette that immediately turned into a nightmare upon on impact with reality. Despite the public outrage, Gillette did not distance themselves from their failed attack on men. Gillette CEO and President Gary Coombe said that angering some consumers with their Me Too campaign was a, quote, price worth pain if it meant that the brand could increase its relevance among younger consumers. He also said, This brand is gently slipping away for this generation. If any of this sounds remarkably familiar, it's because the woman who recently turned Bud Light into a synonym for brand suicide through negative marketing, Alyssa Heinerscheid, said the exact same thing prior to her partnering Bud Light with Hi. this. Of carrying skills, right? I got some Bud Lights for us. I had a really clear job to do when I took over Bud Light. And it was, this brand is in decline. It's been in decline for a really long time. And if we do not attract young drinkers to come and drink this brand, there will be no future for Bud Light. Why was The Best A Man Can Be such an ineffective, indeed a disastrous piece of propaganda? In this video, I'll be examining the ad's subliminal, psychological, symbolic, and auditory elements, and how those elements are used to promote the socio-political doctrine that Procter & Gamble have adopted. I won't be getting bogged down debating the political assertions made in the ad, as that would take far too long, nor is there any need to. This ad was intended to be a bold statement that would position Gillette on the right side of history during the Me Too moment. Well, Me Too is over and not fondly remembered. The Amber Heard versus Johnny Depp libel trial killed what was left of the movement. Even Whoopi Goldberg's show, The View, had to admit the movement was finished after the trial. Now some people call the verdict a big win for Depp and a blow to the Me Too movement. He actually won the libel trial mm -hmm. in all counts, um, and it was a jury trial. So you have five men and two women, and they said across the board um, that, that he prevailed in three counts of defamation. And so this was really a loss for Amber Heard. And Me Too cinema was a total failure. Last year, the flagship Me Too movie, she said, was a calamitous box office bomb. She said, charted the powerful story of how two brave and stunning journalists exposed Harvey Weinstein, though apparently he was doing a pretty good job of that himself. Can you imagine how many Harveys there are out there? You want to get me killed? 
Do you wish you hadn't signed up for this story? Do you? No. That crock of sleep-inducing shite made $13.5 million at the box office on a production budget of around $32 million. To put that into perspective, the box office calamity gay rom-com bros made more than that and cost a lot less. She said was an unmitigated public humiliation for the Me Too movement. It's already become clear that Me Too will be looked back on in much the same way we currently look back on the McCarthyism of the 1950s Red Scare and the Salem Witch Trials. I won't be going into detail about my personal feelings toward the best a man can be, or Gillette, I'll just say that I was a lifelong Gillette customer before the ad and have not bought a single Gillette product since it was released. Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual Toxic harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? In the very first shot, a middle-aged man has a downcast expression. He's so ashamed of having a set of balls that he can barely look himself in the eye. Grey dominates the shot, grey beard, grey hair, grey shirt and grey walls. He's wearing a wife beater which, in popular culture, is associated with domestic violence. Ads by major corporations like Gillette are very carefully thought out and the people who created this ad know the cultural association between wife beater tops and domestic abuse. This is a deliberate subliminal hint that masculinity, men and domestic abuse are inextricably linked. We'll see the wife beater top used again later in the ad. The next toxic male has a face half in shadow extreme close-up on his face to accentuate his self-disgust. The surroundings are grey, he seems to be wearing a greyish shirt, and behind him there is a colourless black and white photo on the wall. Next guy, see him again, face half in shadow, blurred background, the frame is dominated by grey, his hair is grey, he's old, tired, and evidently is profoundly disappointed in himself and is engaging in a daily ritual of two minutes of self-hate. Something Gillette believe all men should make part of of their morning routine. Bullying. The Me Too movement against Toxic sexual harassment. Is this the best a man can get? Gillette used the exact same framing in the next shot. Blurry background dominated by grey, face half obscured in shadow, extreme close up on a forlorn face full of self debasement. It's so similar that this could be the previous guy in his younger days. The dominance of dark murky colours and shadow is used to visually depict the shame these men are feeling and that all men should feel. It also has the more blunt effect of making the framing around the men as ugly as possible. Importantly, there are old, middle-aged and young men, three white guys and a black guy. Gillette wants to make clear that all men should be disgusted with themselves, all men of all ages and races. That's not to say this ad doesn't include elements of intersectional racialism, it absolutely does, as we'll see later. Gillette used a clip from an old ad, probably from the 80s. No attempt has been made to sharpen or improve the image or audio quality of the old logo and ad, either the audio or video quality. And that would be very easy to do. The old ad has deliberately been left in its raw analog era quality to emphasize that this is a relic of the past. This is from the ancient times, the evil times when men celebrated their toxicity, when they actually wanted to look good and attract women and didn't engage in their daily two minutes of self-hate. Bullying. The Me Too movement against Toxic sexual harassment. Masculinity. No! Is this the best? <laughs> The old ad seems to have been blurred slightly, an extreme close-up on the guy's face gives the image a grotesque, ugly, looming effect. Yellow filter has been applied to make this scene look sickly and nauseating. One of the guy's eyes has been obscured, making him look less human and less trustworthy. His face is half obscured in shadow. This creates a visual parallel with the opening images of self-loathing men staring in disgust at themselves in the mirror, the intent being to conflate the two in the mind of the viewer, so there is a subconscious connection made between the self-avowed toxicity of the men in the opening images and the traditionally masculine man from the ancient evil time. The message is clear, all men are toxic, even if they don't want to admit it. The masculine guy's girlfriend kisses him but we never see her eyes. There are two people in frame but we only see one eye. This adds to the grotesque, unnatural, horror-like distortion of the image. The eye is placed right at the top of the screen which is very unnatural. You'll never see that in any piece of media because it looks hideous. Here's a quick example. 
They said, so, like, have you met an SP? <laughs> the Tom Cruise laughing meme. Notice that the eyes of the largest Tom Cruise face are right at the top of the frame. This is one of the many elements that make this image so visually disgusting. The repulsive visuals coupled with Cruise's hilarious expression is the magical ingredient in this meme. Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the same technique is used in The Best Men Can Be to make this image, which was probably quite pleasant and wholesome in its original form, look unsettling and inhuman. Gillette are using subliminal suggestion here to encourage the viewer to associate healthy, traditional relationships between men and women with the nauseating visuals that have been used to distort the original ad. This image is only in the ad for one second, but Gillette have put a lot of effort and thought into making it look as hideous and negative as possible. Next, a boy bursts through the image at the exact point where the girl is kissing her man. This serves several purposes. First and most obviously, it communicates Gillette's current year political imperatives. They want to physically destroy the culture of the past and replace it with their vision of what culture should be. They don't want men looking at images of success, pride and healthy sexual relationships. That's old culture, that's bad. Instead, men should be looking at images that reflect their own toxicity back at them Reflection myself. and feel deep shame. They should be reminded of how much they should feel ashamed of themselves and what a pack of wankers they all were in school. The boy jumping through the image at the point where the woman kisses the man also symbolizes how toxic male behavior inhibits men's ability to connect with women. A very important element here is the physical separation of man and woman. Men and women being happy together is over old culture and must be destroyed. Gillette literally tear man and woman apart. The people making the ad obviously derived a great deal of raw sadistic pleasure at the tearing up of old ads they consider utterly contemptible and beneath the high moral standards of their corporation refined modern urban establishment ideals. Gillette are perfectly happy for men to fuck each other as evidenced by their extensive support of the sexual identitarian movement but they don't want them anywhere near women, which will be emphasized in much less subtle terms later in the ad. Tearing a happy couple physically from one another in the name of moral outrage is also an example of social demoralization. The population need to be kept in a state of moral and spiritual infirmity. Their spirit must be broken, their will to resist crushed, individuals must be made to feel alone and that no one agrees with them, so they best keep their mouth shut. And most importantly, they must feel powerless. A people in this state are far more easily conquered and ruled over than a people who are proud, energetic, united and firm in their beliefs. Seeing a happy couple physically torn apart is a profoundly depressing sight, which is why it's in this ad. Elements of social demoralization are referred to by modern marketing firms as positive messaging. Next, four bullies run out of the image, chasing after the boy who jumped through it. The symbolic message here is that bullying that occurs among teenage boys comes from the uber-masculine behavior exhibited by the older generation of men. A man who looks at himself with pride in the mirror today as his loving wife kisses him on the cheek is instilling a culture of violent insanity in his sons. Toxic masculinity is a kind of virus that spreads from father to son, and only by teaching men to hate themselves and dampen their natural male drives with self-loathing can this toxicity be successfully eradicated. Here's a small but very deliberate detail. One of the bullies is wearing a wife beater. This kid looks around 14 years old and in my own extensive experience as a teacher and a human being, I have never known a 14 year old boy to wear a wife beater. This is a very deliberate wardrobe choice and the intent is to create a subconscious association in the mind of the viewer between the man wearing the wife beater at the video's opening and this rotten little scrote. The depressed, graying man is just as much of a bully as the wee are slick trying to impress the bigger alpha bullies because he's a man. At present we are 11 seconds into this ad. Gillette really want you to hate men and if you are a man to hate yourself.
eyes at the top of the frame again to make the on-screen male look monstrous and deformed. And he's grinning a big, wolfish, maniac smile. This is the only time we'll see a man smile in this ad while engaged in a violent assault on a child. This frame here is probably the best in the ad. The director has obviously told this kid to look crazy and smile like he's enjoying the chase, and the kid absolutely nails it. His expression here is highly memeable. When your boss lets you go home five minutes early, when they're having a sale on antidepressants, when you tell your wife you've been called in for a night shift but you're really going to spend the night with your girlfriend, one of the bullies is wearing a varsity club shirt. In the USA, a varsity club is the squad of a school or college's first team in a sport. Only the most athletically capable male students will make these teams. These athletically gifted students are often referred to as jocks. The use of the varsity club shirt is an example of subliminal messaging in the ad. The viewer isn't meant to be conscious of seeing the shirt. It passes across the frame far too quickly for a viewer to notice it, but it does appear in full frame right at the center of the screen. The viewer is meant to see this ad and subconsciously form an association between the violent sadism of the bullies and male varsity sport athletes. Gillette want to depict male physical exertion of any kind, including sports, as toxic. Later in the ad, we'll see two young boys chastised for wrestling with one another. Just in case the audience didn't get the message that these boys are bullies and want to make their small victim miserable, we see the word FREAK! plastered across the screen with three exclamation marks. Not everything in this ad is negative. This woman is clearly a lovely mother, supporting her son like this. Though I'm not so sure that table is going to support her. Better take it to the couch, love. A distraught looking mother hugs her very upset son, another victim of toxic mandom. A few more cyberbully messages appear, but they're utterly pathetic and unconvincing. Bullies don't use generalized terms like loser to torment their victims. They use insults that are specifically tailored to the victims. For example, when I was in school, I saw a kid lose the top half of his baby finger climbing over a spiked fence. His finger got caught between two of the rails and when he jumped down it stayed caught between those rails. For the next several years he was called four and a half and bullies would ask him questions like if I have five apples and I eat half an apple how many apples do I have left? wankers. The messages that appear in the Gillette ad don't look like something a bully would write. They look like lazy placeholders inserted into the ad by incompetent morons at a marketing firm brainstorming session. In particular, the word sissy looks out of place. This is an extremely antiquated word which hasn't been part of the popular vernacular for decades. The bullies knock over a table and chair on their way through the apartment, emphasizing the destructive nature of unchecked masculinity. There's a fast camera spinning cut to the next scene to emphasize the chaos created by masculine behavior. This is the kind of cut you would see in a horror movie when the victim finally comes face to face with the murderer. We can't hide from it. It's been going on. What horror awaits us on the other side of this spinning cut? A man beating his wife with a belt? A cruel neighborhood drunk setting his dog on the male woman? Patrick Bateman running at the camera with a blood-soaked chainsaw? Let's have a look. It's taking over. And it's an old children's cartoon, showing a few horny men admiring an attractive woman and wolf whistling at her. Gillette will repeatedly push the message that men expressing any sort of sexual interest in a woman is a bad thing, that it's harassment. Gillette's goal here isn't just to criticize wolf whistling, which is a largely extinct practice anyway. It's even illegal in the UK because while the British government doesn't have time to deal with 200,000 house burglaries a year, they do have time to outlaw men expressing sexual interest in a woman. Gillette's goal is to depict any type of male expression of sexual interest in a woman as harassment, an expression of toxic masculinity. In this scene, wolf whistling, grabbing the help's ass, and partying with hot chicks are all shown together in a single cut, as if men having a pool party with hot girls is somehow just as abusive toward women as sexually fondling the housemaid. As much as this ad is anti-male, it also makes plenty of space to send the message that white men are the worst kind of men. In the brief TV montage of stuff Gillette doesn't like, the sexual aggressor is white, and the help is a young black woman. The aggressor is also dressed like a businessman. This is a very conscious effort by Gillette to portray the businessman as an exemplar and indeed a symbol of toxic male success. There is also a strong element of iconoclasm in the besmirchment of the businessman image. Here's how businessmen used to be depicted in popular media. Where the race is wrong.
That commercial was made by Gillette. Since then, the college to corporate pipeline has flooded corporations and marketing firms with brainwashed idiots. We got to experience and learn from lawyers who were also from a diverse background. Who look at old commercials like this. To help a man look, feel, and be his best. The best, the best, the best the Gillette series with and see only negativity. The glorification of toxic masculinity as a positive force. In the minds of the woke morons who control modern marketing, depicting a white businessman as a sexual predator is a reckoning with the past. This Rings of Power actress who plays The first female dwarf? How amazing is that? It's a miracle. In Rings of Power and Diesenberg the first of Moria in The Despot's Rings of Power season 2 sums up the thinking of modern left-wing iconoclasm quite well. This represents progression. This represents an acknowledgement of where we have been and um, a will to get to where we need to be in order for this to be accessible to everyone. Just as Rings of Power is an antidote to the cultural poison injected into society by the Lord of the Rings, Speak your truth. This Gillette commercial stands in proud contrast to the toxic masculinity of Gillette ads from before the fall. The best a man can be also wants to push the idea that things are as bad for women as they always have been and nothing has changed. This is why the three TV clips are from different eras. The television itself corresponds technologically to these three eras. The first TV is a very old black and white set. The next is an old late 90s looking brick and the last is a modern flat screen. These visual elements all emphasize the message that the problem of toxic masculinity and its accompanying evils of expressive male sexual interest, sexual harassment and perfectly normal sexual interest in attractive women are all as bad as each other and as bad as they've ever been. No progress has been made. The ad next shows three bored looking white teenage boys quietly drinking in the toxic elixir poured out from the evil images on TV. Once again we see the message that the boys of today will be the rapists of tomorrow. The wardrobe choices in this ad are absurd. We have already seen a child dressed up in a wife beater and now we get this. Hey, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Wash day tomorrow. Nothing clean, right? <laughs> So we have got three kids dressed in their dad's office clothes. I guess they thought they might have a chance of pulling a woman if they looked a bit older, but when it didn't go as they had expected. Hey, we're, we're just being friendly. <laughs> yeah, where you going? So, uh, what, you too good to talk to us? <laughs> they took off back home to sulk in front of the TV. So the kid on the left is dr <laughs> <laughs> So the kid on the left is dressed in a vomit coloured short sleeve shirt and trousers that are about five sizes too big for him. And the other two are dressed in depressing frumpy office attire that would fit perfectly with the box cubicle nightmare scape of Neo's workplace in The Matrix. The kid in the middle is absolutely swamped by his shirt. It is far too big for him. The background is made to look as drab as possible. Three granny lamps, two photo frames, one containing a painting of the wall behind it, the other an impressionist's rendering of the inside of a sewer pipe. This entire scene is dominated by beige, brown and a vague dull cloudy sky blue. The three kids all hold the exact same expression, a mostly empty, vaguely bored star. The boys on the arm seats mirror each other exactly, slouching against the couch with their arms strung loosely over the sofa arm and their legs spread wide. The boys even have their hair brushed in the same direction, left to right. The goal here is to make the boys look as similar as possible. This is to communicate that men are not individuals with unique inner worlds, they are just men. They are all the same vessel of toxicity just waiting to explode in an orgy of sexual violence. This use of the Manborg element continues throughout the ad. It's very evident that the director has gone out of her way to visually depict these three boys in as negative a light as possible. Their expressions, poses, clothes, surroundings, the colour scheme, the paintings on the walls, every visual element is manipulated to communicate 
ugliness. The frame is also packed with random junk. A grotesque reddish brown seahorse statue that looks like it was shit out along with last night's flaming hot kebab. A palm tree statue inside a snow globe case. The kind of little piece of trash that lies mercifully forgotten in the dusty corner of a pawn shop. And two hugely overstuffed bowls of popcorn intended to give a jarring, nauseating effect to the frame. In the next scene, the same three boys look up at their dad as he comes marching in the door. The help is dusting a lamp and, as you do in front of your three beloved sons when you arrive home from work, he lunges toward the maid with a vaguely monstrous gesture, indicating his desire to have his way with her right there in the kitchen in front of the boys. Who's the daddy? But we better get done with this fine piece of black ass before your mother gets home, right boys? <laughs> When you're trying to get home in time to fuck the maid before your wife returns from work. Oh, by the way, the audience are supposed to applaud the family gang rape of the housemaid. This audience, comprised almost entirely of white men, find this scene hilarious because there's nothing funnier than a father suggesting to his three sons that he would like nothing better after a hard day's work than to fuck the housemaid senseless. Because you know, boys, your mother was a solid bit of gear when we met in college, but 20 years and three kids later, well, let's just say this boys I didn't hire this maid for her conversational skills <laughs> <laughs> The ad presents the evil businessman element again in the next scene. A corporate boardroom filled with white men, presided over by a menacing looking Patrick Bateman wannabe, whose masculinity is so toxic that he refuses to sit down, instead presiding over the meeting in a standing lunge, so as to better project his male authority and toxic masculinity over the meeting. Patrick Bateman wannabe has slicked back American Psycho her and a featureless black suit. The solitary female has attempted to contribute to the meeting and been quickly interrupted by Patrick Bateman wannabe. He places an unwelcome, rapey hand on her shoulder and mansplains her own area of expertise to her. What I actually think she's trying to say. When incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me. There's a glaring editing error here. Watch Patrick Bateman wannabe's left hand. What I actually think she's trying to say. One second it's resting comfortably on solitary female's shoulder, the next it has magically vanished. Solitary female looks down in dejected disappointment, just one more victim of toxic masculinity. Next, two little boys are shown engaged in rough and tumble play. This perfectly natural, normal and healthy behaviour is conflated with the sexual harassment of the horny dad and the alpha asshole behaviour of Patrick Bateman wannabe. Yes, Gillette are suggesting that the rough and tumble play of young boys will, if unchecked, ultimately lead them to sexually harassing the housemaid in front of their own children, and in doing so, pass on to the next generation the evil ways of man in the endless cycle of toxic masculinity. Next, the ad presents making the same old excuses that men make to justify the reprehensible behaviour of their sons. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. When men are wrestling with each other as children. Boys will be boys. When incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me. Boys will be boys. When men grab a domestic service worker's ass in front of his own kids. Boys will be boys. When men chase down a fleeing prostitute with a chainsaw after cannibalizing a fresh murder victim. Boys will be boys. The first image of the dads is the most stereotypical, lazy idea of a dad conceivable. Three fat, middle-aged guys in short sleeve shirts with a tire around their waist, standing over a barbecue, looking over at the violent behavior behavior of their sons with mildly interested expressions. Clearly too lazy to do anything about it. Easier to just make excuses for toxic masculinity. The commercial hasn't exactly been subtle up to this point, but if subtlety is a surgeon's blade and obtrusiveness is a sledgehammer, what the ad does next is a death star. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. A long line of men chanting boys will be boys will be boys will be boys like empty headed sheep bleeding out some dumb vacuous platitudinal mantra in order to emphasize the manborg element as emphatically as possible the oh my sweet iced peach green tea lemonade frappuccino could you stop already i am literally losing all faith in humanity just listening to this okay let's unpack this 
The men in this image are meant to symbolize the suffocating conformity that is required of all male identifying people who want to integrate into the patriarchy. Gillette are trying to communicate that men are forced to adopt the behaviors prescribed within the narrow range of the predetermined masculine role, and in doing so, lose all sense of themselves as self-actuated individuals, and create a hostile, toxic environment for non-men. No non-playable sheep, Gillette are attempting to redefine masculinity out of existence, first by strawmanning it, then by suggesting that the only way for men to improve is to embrace the new Gillette-endorsed regime-approved definition of masculinity, one in which the rough-and-tumble play of small boys is toxic masculinity. Encouraging women to have a good time is considered wrong. Smile, sweetie. Come on. And approaching a woman with the hope of initiating a sexual relationship is... Not cool, not cool. As I was saying, the Manborg element is emphasized by the sameness of clothes, hair, posture, pose, expression, speech, and even height of the men in the frame. They're all wearing short sleeve shirts, they all have roughly the same haircut, medium length, slightly wavy hair, and combed away from the forehead. The three most visible men have scruffy five o'clock shadows, they all have their arms crossed, and are all leaning back slightly. All have the same serious but slightly confused look on their face. They're all about the same height except for one guy at the end of the line. All the men are using the same barbecue with the same meat and vegetables cooking. The smoke billowing up from the barbecue barbecues also gives the scene a chaotic feel, a visual suggestion that masculinity, or at least this ridiculous straw man that Gillette depicts as masculinity, is not only suffocatingly conformist, but also chaotic. Next, the turn. The point in the ad at which men become aware of their own toxicity and begin acting in a manner that Gillette approves of. The right way. Not cool, not cool. The Barbecue Manborg closes out the All Meals Are Evil section of the ad, and we are next introduced to the voice of reason, Anna Kasparian. I'm fucking better than you, okay? Much better than you. You are garbage, okay? You're garbage, and it is what it is. I'd rather be a social justice warrior than a piece of fucking shit. Yes, Gillette believes that what men, male teens, and little boys really need in their life is Anna Kasparian to give them a moral lecture. I'm fucking better than you, okay? Much better than you. You are garbage, okay? You're garbage. The solitary image of Anna Kasparian contrasts strongly with the long line of manbots chanting in unison, their minds irreparably diseased by toxic masculinity. This visual contrast further emphasizes Kasparian's role as the voice of reason. You're garbage. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. After Saint Anna, Gillette decides to reference the NPC meme. Orange man bad. Orange man bad. Orange man. Orange man. Orange man. Orange man. Orange man. This is actually an interesting example of the right and left wing looking at the same thing and drawing two completely different conclusions. From a right wing perspective, a screen full of identical talking heads all making the same points, expressing the same ideas, and reading from the same sheet of talking points is evidence that the mainstream media is a many-headed hydra under the control of the regime. From a left wing perspective, the fact that many independent independent news organizations have all reached the same conclusion and are all saying the same thing means that it must be true. This is the perspective of Gillette and this is what the ad is communicating here. Everyone agrees with us. If you disagree, you're outnumbered. No one agrees with you. You're outdated. So keep your mouth shut if you don't want to get laughed out of the room. This NPC scene is meant to depict trailblazing journalists boldly breaking through the walls of toxic male behaviour, which is why women on screen here outnumber the men two to one. Quick aside, the despot would like to communicate his approval for any society in which women outnumber men two to one. This would be an excellent remedy for hoflation. Minimum income, so... I'm gonna say at least 200. 200 grand? The audience, which previously guffawed at the sight of a harassed housemaid, now sit in obedient silence at the sight of the austere establishment talking heads, telling them where they've gone wrong and what they need to do to improve. This is a meta element and a subliminal instruction to the viewers, explaining to them how they are supposed to feel while watching the ad. 
The media NPCs represent the screen that the viewer is watching, the stern castigating gaze of the establishment and the Gillette commercial itself, and the audience is of course the viewer. This subliminal instruction is employed to encourage the men viewing the ad to feel bad about themselves. It's a fairly advanced propaganda technique but very poorly executed. The problem is that the force of admonishment, the disapproving gaze, comes not from the organic grassroots experience of everyday people but from above from journalists, the media, the wealthy, the establishment. Gillette are here endorsing the idea that the everyman must look to the rich and powerful for guidance. This notion is rejected by all except those on the extreme fringes of the political spectrum. Gillette wants the viewer to feel that he has been rightfully chastised by a force of righteousness. Instead, he feels set upon by a powerful establishment ganging up on him. Gillette take it for granted that the corporate media industrial complex is a force of moral guidance since they are part of it, it did not occur to them that the vast majority of people do not think of CNN as a force of moral authority. This bungled deployment of subliminal instruction was a terrible blunder by Gillette. What they should have done was have a screen populated by women of all ages telling their Me Too story through shitty camera phones, crying, wailing and stuttering as they recount the horrors that toxic men have inflicted upon them. While the audience of toxic men men look on, shaken to their core at this reflection of their own toxic behaviour. Reflection of myself. This would have transferred the moral centre of gravity from the corrupt establishment to the everyday woman. Now the subliminal instruction is not to do as the regime tells you, but to hear these victims' voices. This would have served the dual purpose of conflating the ad's moral messages with the suffering of female victims and of encouraging victimhood junkies to support the ad and shill for it on social media. By the way, I stole the term victimhood junkie from Echo Chamberlain. He has a great channel. There's a link to it in the description. Back to the two minutes of self-hate. Because we, we believe in the best in men. But this time, one of the men is smiling a little bit. You see, there's no male existential crisis that a bit of self-loathing and an afternoon of MSNBC can't cure. Next, we get a montage of black men telling white men to start behaving more like how Gillette think a man should behave. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To act the right um, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. It starts with two very offended hot girls at a pool party reacting in justified disgust at being told by a pool jock to Smile, sweetie. A favourite misandrist cliche that even found its way into the recent Barbie movie. But the not white knight swoops in to rescue the set upon damsels. Come on. After his heroic intervention, the camera is positioned below the not white knight in a low angle shot. The camera looking up at the hero from below is a technique pioneered by Lenny Riefenstahl in her propaganda movie Triumph of the Will. The effect is to give the hero an air of power and moral authority. It's a tried and true technique in propaganda. This technique is inversed when the intent is to portray the subject as weak, diminished, small and morally repugnant. Here's a recent example of this from The Guardian, who used the inverted hero shot in this article to present Rudy Giuliani as a figure of supreme smallness and almost demented repulsiveness. By the way, I do not know what in the holiest of Venti Caramel Crunch Frappuccinos the pool jock is wearing, but if anyone ever catches me dead of an overdose of drugs that I paid for with money I stole from a disabled child, my body rotting in the shit covered bathroom of a crack house and clothed in that top, please, for the sake of my dignity, remove it from my corpse before anyone sees it. Following the defeat of the pool jock clad in Satan's well-made fabric, a woman with large breasts is seen walking down the street. Street jock sees woman with large breasts walk past and, excited at the prospect of seeing those breasts in their magnificent natural form, begins a pursuit. But he is stopped by the heroic intervention of vaguely metrosexual not white knight. Vaguely metrosexual not white knight prevents his bro from attempting a perfectly normal and quite honestly admirably courageous approach of a woman he finds attractive. 
This is just about the worst thing any man can do to a bro short of outright betrayal. This is the scolding, cowardly, crab in a bucket behaviour of a snivelling wimp, terrified at the prospect that his friend's success may leave him wallowing alone in his own pathetic failure. If a man did this, he would very quickly find himself a social pariah among his soon to be former bros. And yet, according to Gillette, vaguely metrosexual, not white knight is the hero in this exchange, a protector of all women from potential relationships with clearly confident men that women are likely to find attractive. The inclusion of this exchange is another major blunder. If Gillette framed their ad as a general opposition to sexual harassment, which they attribute to all men, the response would largely divide along party lines. But by framing their commercial as being opposed to all masculine interaction, up to and including approaching women, they come off as puritanical woke scolds who want a society in which men are treated like errant children to be told off and who must be constantly monitored and which treats women as ultra fragile wimps that need to be quarantined off from the lustful attentions of men. There are some truly miserable human beings out there who would like to see such a society but they are very few in number. Gillette's social prescriptions are so extreme that they will only appeal to the fanatical fringe. The problem is that the idiots who make media like the best men can be, are closed off from reality within a social media and professional right think bubble. And so they think the political fringe is the societal mainstream. Next, Justin Trudeau watches the Varsity Gang from earlier chase down their victim. The Varsity Club t-shirt is again prominent in the background. Gillette next show a man trying to settle a dispute between two boys about to fight. Young men. This clip is inserted to re-emphasize the message that men and boys are naturally toxic, violent animals that need to be controlled by an overseer. We get the same message hammered into the viewer again when Justin Trudeau is forced to rescue the small boy from the varsity gang. We also get this clip. I am strong. I am strong. It's okay for a man to tell his daughter that she's strong, but if his son displays any physical strength, he is to be told off. It's not how we treat each other, okay? And again, we see here the message that man cattle need to be carefully monitored. The end of the ad is downright sinister. A little boy staring straight into the camera with the exact same expression worn by the men at the start of the ad engaged in their two minutes of self-hate. He's even wearing a grey shirt, just like the guy at the start. The final message is loud and clear. All men, all boys are toxic. Only through self-loathing, constant monitoring and the eradication of all naturally masculine drives from the youngest possible age can men be cured of their toxic masculinity. The biggest mistake Gillette make with The Best Men Can Be and the main reason this short film feels so completely as a propaganda piece is bad narrative perspective. Just as the subliminal instruction element placed the elite in the position of moral authority, the entire ad positions Gillette themselves as the literal voice of moral authority. The narrator's voice is run of the mill, heard it a million times, instantly forgettable and speaking from the third person. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off, making the same old excuses. It is the voice of Gillette telling the viewer what to think, how to act and what to feel. By casting themselves in the role of narrator, the voice of moral authority, Gillette come off looking like a juggernaut waging war against the tiny little people below. There are very few people in history who understood propaganda as well as George Orwell. In 1984, there is a famous scene in which O'Brien explains the future of humanity to Winston. If you want a vision of the future, Winston, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. In The Best A Man Can Be, Gillette are that boot, stomping on the face of all men. Procter & Gamble made almost $70 billion in revenue the year before this ad was released, when an all-powerful megacorporation starts talking down to people, in this case men, the viewer cannot see them as anything other than the great boot, stomping on the little guy, which is exactly what Gillette's commercial is.
When Nike released their Pro BLM ad, they didn't have some blunt force narration hammering the viewer with messages from a hammy script. They used Colin Kaepernick, one of the most prominent victims for hire in the US at the time. He did his whole Voice of the Oppressed song and dance, and Nike were able to get plenty of free publicity on social media, and the reaction divided along party lines, as planned. When Adidas were promoting female obesity, also known as body positivity, they used a prominent social media pro-obesity act to narrate the commercial. I've been told I don't look like an athlete. Well, they are dead wrong. And it worked. They got a fairly good response considering they were doing the bidding of Lucifer. But it wouldn't have worked if they had made the same mistake Gillette made and just threw together a collage of anti-hot girl pro-obesity nonsense and narrated it themselves entirely from their own perspective. Is this the hottest a woman can get? Is it? It's time for society's idea of female beauty to expand, to enlarge, to grow. Gillette should have used a first-person narrative to infuse the commercial with the power of victimhood. They should have reprimanded men not from the perspective of the regime, but from the perspective of battered women. The despot is a respectful student of the art of propaganda. If I had been hired to make this ad, I would have had the rape victim who would be introduced as a rape survivor narrate the video from her perspective, telling her story while also pushing the anti-men, anti-boy doctrine that Gillette endorse. This would have emotionally blackmailed those on the left into supporting the ad while creating a strong line of defense against those who attacked it from the right. You don't support this ad? Then you don't support survivors. You're a pro-rapist. You spread rape culture by not supporting Gillette. Narrative, framing, and perspective are everything in propaganda. Get them wrong and the propaganda will falter. Gillette got all three wrong, and the result was that Gillette's historic moment, their epic rebranding, was an absolute fucking catastrophe.